Deb, hearing from Dr. Jeffrey Lawson, a professor of surgery and pathology at the Duke University Medical Center, where he also fills multiple director roles within the vascular surgery field. Dr. Lawson has had a lifelong interest in the field of blood coagulation and vascular biology, and has continuously studied these areas both scientifically and clinically. He is an internationally recognized leader in the field of vascular translational technology. He is a co-author of over 120 journal articles on the topics of hemostasis, tissue engineering, and vascular surgery, and lectures in both of these topics nationally and internationally. Dr. Lawson's research laboratory has been funded by grants from the American Heart Association, National Institutes of Health, Department of Defense, and various biotechnology companies. Following his talk, we will be having a brief intermission with food, but for now, sit back and enjoy. Uh, good afternoon, and what a wonderful event. I want to thank the, uh, all of the students that are backstage, which you can't see, but have dedicated an incredible amount of time to putting this event together. So the challenge today, the challenge that I'm going to put forward is the challenge of tissue engineering a blood vessel, a human blood vessel for replacing a human heart. And before I do that, I have a couple of housekeeping issues I want to make sure we get out, because there are three important ones. One, I'm here talking about this today, but this is the work of an incredibly uh, a large number of people over a number of years. So not only has my laboratory at Duke been involved in this, but my principal collaborator, Dr. Laura Nicholson, who's now at Yale, her laboratory, a number of our collaborators at Duke who've helped us with this project, a number of surgeons around the world, and a Duke-founded technology company, a tissue engineering company called Humicite, which is here in RTP, which actually has a whole crew of people that manufacture these vessels. Without all of these people, this talk doesn't exist. And so it's incredibly important to realize that this is a team effort. The second thing is I'm a surgeon. And to show you what tissue engineering blood vessels look like, we have a couple of slides that are surgically oriented slides. And if you know what I mean, they're humans taken apart. I take apart people for a living. So I'm going to share with you what some of those pictures look like. I hope it doesn't offend anyone. And then third, we're currently taking this technology for hopes of true human use, which means we're studying it under a formal clinical trial, which requires us to submit this information ultimately to the FDA. And while everything I'm telling you today I believe to be true, none of it can be perceived to be used as claims in the technical term of claims by the FDA until we've completed all of our clinical research. So with that, I'm going to take you on our journey, our story, uh, mostly through pictures. So this is a blood vessel. This is actually sort of a rendition of a blood vessel. But it's a thing I've been studying my entire professional life, both the blood that travels through it and the structure that it's made of. It's an amazing structure. It's an amazing structure, and it lives throughout us. If you look at this human face, and I hope it projects, you can see that we're made up entirely of blood vessels. We have large blood vessels, blood vessels that we fix. We have small blood vessels that live through every organ and every system in our body. And while these blood vessels are essential for our vitality, they're also the product of our demise. And what do I mean? Cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in Western society. And shown behind me are a couple of examples of that. Up on the left would be a heart that has cardiovascular disease in its coronary arteries. It's what causes a heart attack. In the middle picture, cardiovascular disease at the extremities is what causes people to lose limbs, not ambulate, by the disruption of their blood vessels. And shown on the right side simply is just what this looks like, because if you're going to understand this study and potentially try to repair it, you see what this plaque is, this progressive growing closed of blood vessels. It's where they ultimately become occluded, and if they become occluded or blocked in the wrong place, we die, we have a stroke, we have a heart attack, we lose a limb. So what does this stuff really look like? This is what I do during my day job. I'm taking human blood vessels apart, 
This is a human carotid artery. We're actually removing this atherosclerosis, this plaque, from a patient's artery in hopes of preventing them from having a stroke. There's actually a relatively limited number of areas in the body that we can do this where we directly extract the plaque or the blockage. Um, and more often than not, sometimes we'll do other technologies, which I'm not going to go into today, like stinting. But the primary technology which I do is to bypass those blockages. And when I say bypass, I mean to completely circumvent that obstruction with a new tube. And as shown again in the upper left, that white line that you see streaking across the heart, that's a bypass curve. That's a bypass, that's a saphenous vein taken from a patient, sewn onto that patient's heart, connecting two blood vessels around the blockage. Pedal on the bottom is actually a bypass in the patient's leg, and I hope it projects, but you can see that long incision. That really hurts. <laughs> that long incision requiring us to reconstruct the blockage in some, some patient's leg, so hopefully he doesn't lose his foot and he can continue to walk. And then this odd picture in the upper right is a life-sustaining bypass that we do for patients with kidney failure. And it's important for this talk because kidney failure is where we've started to implant our blood vessels in humans because we take this blood vessel that runs, in this case this is a patient's own blood vessel, but that runs under their skin, providing high blood flow so they can actually get hooked up to a dialysis machine three times a week and get life-sustaining cleansing of their blood because their kidneys no longer work. So in that unique situation, where we have to wash somebody's blood in a machine three times a week to keep them alive, we have to make a blood vessel run just under their skin. And it turns out that is fraught with all kinds of problems, but it's also the interesting place that the FDA and other people like to test new technologies in the vascular space, because you can see it right under the skin. And if it fails there, you haven't caused somebody to have a heart attack, or a stroke, or lose a limb. You simply rebuild their dialysis practice. Well, what do harvesting blood vessels for bypass and for building these dialysis tracks look like? This is a picture of what it takes to get a vein out of somebody's body. It's a long operation, and if you look at these kinds of incisions in our hospital, about 15% of our patients will have significant complications from the wound itself of harvesting the vein. And when those veins aren't even available, number of patients, then we have synthetic materials. And currently our synthetic materials are made principally of Teflon or Dacron or other sort of synthetic polymers. They can be made, they can be manufactured relatively easily, but they're brought with two principal problems. One is they're, because they're not made of any human tissue and they're not made of these endothelial cells that our blood likes to travel through, they're prone to clotting. They're prone to what we call thrombosis. And because they're foreign, they're actually prone to infection. This is just, again, a picture, and I hope it projects of what one of these synthetic materials actually looks like. What you see on the top of it, that's the outer surface of what that tube is, at the very top of this, is you see basically a scar. It's a foreign, we call it a foreign body reaction. The body's always identifying that, trying to encase it with scar tissue. And this synthetic material, this Teflon material in the middle, is sort of like styrofoam. It's filled with debris from our own cells, never living cells. And at the very bottom, which is the layer that contacts the blood, the blood has to travel through, it never re endothelializes It never gets that surface, that shiny surface that I showed in the first slide, that the blood wants to travel through. And that's why these things are prone to failure. And in some cases, failure 50% in a year when they're used for dialysis cracks. It's a remarkable thing, 50% failure if you're going to do an operation. So after studying blood and blood vessels my whole life, I've come up with three very basic observations, and I'm going to share those with you. First, blood likes to move through tubes lined by cells. When the blood is traveling through a tube, and we, we have lots of tubes that aren't lined by cells, we have coronary artery bypass grafting and all kinds of different pumps and things, the blood likes to move through tubes lined by cells. It knows when it's not in a tube that's lined by cells, it, gets, it activates its clotting system, and it activates what we call inflammation. Second, blood likes to move through tubes that wiggle. There's something innate about the expanding and contracting that starts with our heart and travels throughout our entire body, but it absorbs energy and it continues to, to propel the pulsatility of blood that's fundamentally important to the structure. And then finally, I showed you that picture about harvesting a vein, but even the best veins, when we take them for arterial reconstruction, we take a vein to make it be an artery, 
Even the best, best veins don't like being arteries. They weren't engineered for it, they weren't designed for it, they were designed for the veins, and what happens over a period of time is those veins will begin to grow closed. They, they go through a process, we call it intimal hyperplasia, but they thicken, and then finally grow completely closed. That's why I have a lot of redo business. But if you look at the data around this, that 40% 40 of our coronary vein grafts that we sew on the people's hearts, the vein reconstructing their hearts, 40% of them are occluded in a year because of this fundamental process. So we set out the challenge on a long road. The challenge was to see if we could actually make a blood vessel, make something that functioned like a human blood vessel, structurally behaved like a human blood vessel, like a human artery. But we could make it so we didn't have to take an inadequate vessel out of somebody's leg and, and, and cause that wound as much. And this story doesn't occur without some serendipity and some luck. And this is a picture of my colleague and friend and research partner, Dr. Laura Nicholson. I put it in here specifically because I think we met by accident. So another message here is when something falls, you know, something falls together, never miss the opportunity to grab it. Laura is a biomedical engineer, but she's also a clinical anesthesiologist. And she was starting her career at Duke, and I was starting my career at Duke as a vascular surgeon. And we met by accident. We met in the operating room, and we're delayed in the operating room, so we're talking about research. And she was making these little muscle tubes that she wanted to, she'd come down from MIT and wanted to sort of see if she could, could create a tubular structure that might be a blood vessel. And I was trying to engineer the lining of blood vessels. And we realized we had an innate partnership. And she at least had a knucklehead surgeon who could sew the tubes in when she got prototypes that she wanted to test. So we became friends and colleagues and started down this road of seeing if we could actually make a blood vessel. And we knew this is possible. And this is one of those other things. Never be afraid to sort of dream or think outside the box. But we know that blood vessels are made in every one of us, and they're made in the wombs of women who are pregnant around the world every day. We may not understand how it's done, but we know it's possible. In fact, we know that kidneys and livers and eyes and brains are all made. We don't understand those yet, but the blood vessel is a straightforward enough structure that we might be able to understand that. And so we set out to develop a very straightforward technology, and that's based on using what is a biodegradable scaffold. It's a polymer um, that will melt away over time. But you can put that polymer in a shape, in this case the shape of a tube, and seed it with smooth muscle cells from an animal. Those smooth muscles, those are the vascular smooth muscle cells, the, the, the cells that make up the, the middle layer of the artery. And if you grow them right, and this took a lot of tinkering, but if you grow them right, they can grow structure that is the stuff the cells are made of. And this is the first mock-up of how we were trying to make these called bioreactors, but it's where you flow media under sort of pulsatile conditions uh, through these biodegradable scaffolds in the shape that you want, you can make a little blood vessel. And so from the sort of late 90s to the early 2000s, we worked on this where we could actually grow a blood vessel from the cells of an animal and grow it strong enough because early on a lot of them would just fall apart. And then line that blood vessel with that animal's own endothelial cells and sew it back in that animal. Sounds kind of crazy. But we realized we could make something that actually would work for an individual. So we could take your cells, grow your blood vessel, and potentially implant it back into you. The only problem we have is logistics. Is if you're sick in a hospital somewhere in Atlanta, and you need a bypass on your heart or a bypass on your leg, you don't have time to ship your cells to Raleigh-Durham to have your blood vessel made for three months, and then potentially have it shipped back there and get lost in FedEx. Uh, and then implant it back in you. It's just an impossible business model. So we have to really change our thinking and figure out how can we manufacture a blood vessel that would function like a blood vessel would be off the shelf. And so we changed the technology to make a universal donor and actually, not to use that loosely, we actually take vascular smooth muscle cells from donors, from organ donors, the same people that give up, by the grace of God, their hearts and their kidneys and their lungs for other people. They also now give us a sample of their aorta that we use to grow not just one blood vessel, but multiple blood vessels on that biodegradable scaffold. This is what it looks like. This is one of the modern bioreactors grown actually 
I have a photograph that Humicite, which is the biotech company I mentioned earlier. Around. These are grown under pulsatile conditions. Some of the amazing things, they're grown in fetal heart rates. They grow better if you grow them like a little baby. Um, and, and it requires a lot of tinkering and a lot of very careful planning to grow these things logistically strong enough. And then once they're grown, those cells that were taken from an individual who donated his aortic cells have to actually be removed. So we make it an alive tissue and then have to kill it. Why do you say that? We have to kill it because it has antigens. It has those things that make each of us unique in the cells. So through a lot of chemical washing, we remove the cells. And what's left is the structure. And what's shown on the bottom here is that structure is a tube made of human extracellular matrix tissue. Kind of looks like calamari. Kind of so looks like calamari. <laughs> and this is actually what it looks like. This is this long tube. It's actually now made 40 centimeters long, 6 millimeters in diameter, kind of like the size of your little finger, only longer. And it can be folded into sort of shapes. You can see it doesn't sort of kink. And it's structural properties. I don't know if it produces, but it's has the same strength of a human native artery when you're trying to pull a suture through it or you're trying to burst it. And this is actually what it's made of. It's made up of human collagen. So instead of being made up of an artificial polymer, this is the stuff that we're all made of. It's the stuff our skin is made of, and it's the stuff that our smooth muscle cells and our blood vessels are made of. Collagen, primarily, and then some of these other extracellular matrix proteins. We had to take that structure and put it through a series of experiments that were very, very difficult. You can't do this without putting these in animals because you have to test it under those conditions. And this is an example of putting that structure in the neck of an animal and then tying off or clamping off the natural artery and then leaving it there for over a year. You can see on the far right panel it's 52 weeks. To make sure this thing isn't going to fall apart just today, to fall apart from a year from now, we're going to put it in you. It's an experiment done by my colleague and friend Dr. Alan Kipson, who's now a heart surgeon at ECU. He trained initially to do. But this is actually sewing one of those prototype vessels onto the heart of an animal in the name of being a coronary artery bypass. And probably the hardest set of experiments that we had to do is we actually had to take the human prototype blood vessel and implant them into primates, which is a very difficult thing to do. We had to implant them in primates in, under similar conditions that would be used to simulate hemodialysis, this, this blood vessel that runs under your arm because we knew we had to sew the first one to humans in that same exact system. Well, if you implant those in animals for six months and then take them out, you can look at what they look like. And instead of looking like a, a vein that's grown closed, they in fact look like a tubular structure. It almost looks like a human arm. They have tissue around them. And the most amazing things happen. Because not only did we implant the structure that we decellularize, and it looks like that initially, it begins to remodel. It remodels the collagen, that structure. The body begins to modify the shape. And it begins to grow new proteins that are essential for vascular function. In this case, human elastin, which is that protein that allows the blood vessels to expand and contract. But the most amazing thing, I think, as a scientist, is to see these blood vessels that start off with no cells, the structure that we decellularize over a period of months, we don't know the exact time points, but over a period of months, they grow in your cells. So it started off as our structure, as shown here. This is the muscular cells that the animal was sewn in, grown into the blood vessel, becomes their tissue. And it becomes relined with their own lining cells. So these are the endothelial cells of the animal that was implanted. So we start off with our structure, and it transitioned into their blood vessel. Complete magic. So after all of that work, we had to do the, what, again, I think would be the next hardest thing. And it's this leap of faith. As you've worked on something your entire professional career, and you think you know it works, but you have to then ask some human to say, you know, we've never done this before. Do you mind if we sew this into you? <laughs> so, we had, so we had to take a leap of faith. Fundamentally, we had to ask people, we had to get regulatory approval, both in Europe and the United States, and ask people if they were willing to be pioneers with us, to move forward with this technology. And this is an example, after about a year of regulatory processing, and in fact in Europe ahead of us, but in Poland. And again, with a surgical team from Poland that trained with us and actually participated. So in the first human tissue engineered blood vessel of this type in the arm of a human. That's the dialysis tract, so on the patient's uh, armpit. 
And that's sewn on their artery where they connect this circuit. And this is the completed graft. First one implanted in a human. And you can see the timestamp. It was December 5th, 2012, about 16 months ago. That graft is still functioning and providing life sustaining therapy for that patient. Well, as fate would have it, we got regulatory approval in the United States a few months later, and six months to the day, we returned to Duke Hospital in the same operating room that Dr. Nicholson and I, Laura and I, met by coincidence, by serendipity, and took one of these blood vessels thrown down the road, an RTP, brought it into the operating room and implanted it into the first human in the United States. Again, through a relatively limited operation, we were able to take this tube, this structure, this tissue engineered extracellular matrix, and implant it into the arm of one of my patients from Danville, Virginia. And just to show you what it looks like nine months later, this is still functioning in his arm, being used for dialysis, and by all criteria we can, can measure, appears to have taken on the characteristics of his own blood vessel. So we've come to the end of the beginning in many ways. We have many things left to do. We have to study this existing platform to its completion, we have to make the structure in different shapes and sizes to see if we can use it for the brain and the heart and other parts of the body. We have to see if we can think this technology extended to other tissues. But we know we can make a human tissue that, when implanted, behaves like a human blood vessel, at least particularly in the setting for dialysis access and we believe for lower extremity bypass. But that will be years of research still ahead of us. My challenge for you, the biomedical engineering students in the audience, to see if you can take our work and the work of others in this field and not just grow a blood vessel one day, but grow a kidney. See if you can alleviate the need for dialysis in the first place. If you grow a heart or lungs for people with chronic pulmonary disease who can't breathe anymore or suffocating, grow them lungs. Or for those who are blind, grow them up. That's your challenge. I'll leave you with a quote, actually a plaque that hangs in my office by the late Steve Jobs. It says, the ones who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. So on behalf of my laboratory, the laboratory at Yale, laboratories at Humicite, our colleagues around the world, I thank you.